Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 8th, and we have just 40 days until the first day of spring. Today, we celebrate an English critic who wrote some of our most beautiful quotes about gardens, nature, and flowers. And we'll also learn about a dedicated English naturalist who lived in the rainforest for 11 years and provided ample proof of Darwin's theory of evolution. We'll hear words from a gardener and nursery owner about gardening and garden attire in winter. And we grow that garden library today with a book that helps us make some great garden projects with concrete. Prepare to be amazed. And then we'll wrap things up with a letter from Jane Austen to her sister Cassandra, written on this day 214 years ago. But first, here's today's curated news. Today, I stumbled across a blog that was called Words and Herbs, or Herbs, depending on how you say it. And this was a post from last March. And the author of this blog said, with nasty germs being top news at the moment, I thought I would share this lovely poem that my mom received from fellow gardeners last year. Well, I had to chuckle because I've seen this poem before. It's called The Gardening Doctor, and it's a play on botanical nomenclature, which, if you didn't know better, sounds an awful lot like medical terminology. And there's no surprise that there is sometimes some crossover there, of course, between herbalism and medicine. There are plenty of crossovers. In any case, I thought I would share this poem with you today, and then if you'd like to read it for yourself, you can find it in the Facebook group for the show, and I'll also feature it in the newsletter that'll come out on Friday. So if you'd like to subscribe to the newsletter, all you have to do is head on over to the website, thedailygardener.org, and then once you're there, you'll see a little sign up for the newsletter, and you just put in your email, and then you'll get the this poem in your inbox on Friday. In any case, here's the poem. It's called The Gardening Doctor, and it's just loaded with botanical nomenclature. So here we go. Do you suffer from plumbago? Is your back a little sore? Or perhaps it's pyracanthus, which you sought in Singapore. You've a nasty little hosta, which I think I'll have to lance. And I notice a spirea has been leading you a dance. Are you getting forgetful? Is nemesia the cure? Does your antirrhinum pain you when you're walking out of doors? You've had skimia rubella. I can see that by your nose. And cornus captosa has played havoc with your toes. How is your viburnum tinus? Have you lost your sense of smell? Use a syringa reflexa. That should keep it well. I'm afraid your macrocarpus isn't really up to scratch. And do avoid nigella. It's a nasty thing to catch. Still, I think you're doing nicely. Watch the quercus in your knees. Take your berberus twice nightly. Next patient please. Isn't that sweet? It's called The Gardening Doctor. Now, if you'd like to read that post for yourself, you can wait till Friday and get it in the newsletter, or you can see it right now today in the Facebook group for the show, The Daily Gardener Community. And to find this post quickly, just search for the word doctor, and this poem will pop up. And if you're not in the group, it's very easy to join. Just search for Daily Gardener Community where you'd search for a friend in Facebook and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the leading Victorian era English art critic, watercolorist, thinker, and philanthropist, John Ruskin, who was born on this day, February 8th in 1819. 
John Ruskin is responsible for some of the most beautiful thoughts and quotes that have ever been written about the natural world. With regard to gardening, John wrote, The highest reward for man's toil is not what he gets for it, but what he becomes by it. John's own garden at times could be a disappointment. And at the end of the summer of 1879, John wrote, Looking over my kitchen garden yesterday, I found it one miserable mass of weeds gone to seed, and the roses in the higher garden putrefied into brown sponges, feeling like dead snails, and the half-ripe strawberries all rotten at the stalks. Well, as for John's property at Brantwood, today his home and garden are administered by a charitable trust, and the property name Brantwood has Norse etymology. Brant means steep, and the property sits on a wooded high point overlooking a lake. A champion of the environment, John's love of nature is reflected in his criticisms of his contemporaries, and it's also in much of his writing. John wrote, Nature is painting for us, day after day, pictures of infinite beauty. And he also wrote, Remember that the most beautiful things in the world are the most useless peacocks, and lilies, for instance. And finally, there's one famous garden saying from John Ruskin you might recognize. Kind hearts are the garden. Kind thoughts are the roots. Kind words are the blossoms. And kind deeds are the fruit. And by the way, that little saying makes for an adorable sign in the garden. And today is the birthday of the self-taught British entomologist, explorer, and naturalist, Henry Walter Bates, who was born on this day, February 8th in 1825. Unlike many of his scientist friends and peers, Henry was entirely self-taught. In the mid-1840s, Henry met the great English naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, who had one of the most intelligent scientific minds of his time. Alfred was said to have, quote, the head of a man and the heart of a boy. And so it's no surprise that Henry and Alfred became great friends. Together, the two men began planning a trip to explore the Amazon rainforest. And to pay for their trip, they reached out to universities, collectors, and institutions, and they started a bucket list of desired specimens. Within a year, the men had enough funding to start their big adventure. So in 1848, Henry and Alfred left to explore the Amazon rainforest. Henry recorded the moment that they arrived in Brazil. He wrote, It was with deep interest that my companion and myself, both now about to see and examine the beauties of a tropical country for the first time, gazed on the land where I, at least, eventually spent 11 of the best years of my life. And while Henry stayed in the rainforest for 11 years, Alfred returned to England after four years. And it's worth noting that all of Alfred's specimens and notes were lost at sea on his voyage home after his ship caught fire and sank. Alfred and the crew nearly died, but they were rescued after 10 days adrift in the Atlantic. Meanwhile, back in the Amazon, Henry felt quite at home in the jungle, and he wrote, There is something in a tropical forest akin to the ocean in its effect on the mind. 
Man feels so completely his insignificance there in the vastness of nature. Now, the excellent Palm House at Kew was already seven years old when Henry and Alfred departed for the Amazon. And in an ironic twist, Henry compared the rainforest to the Palm House in his writing instead of the other way around when he wrote that the Amazon rainforest was like a great palm house spread over a large tract of swampy ground. That was quite the thing for Henry to have written. During his 11 years in the rainforest in Brazil, Henry collected butterflies, and he sent back a whopping 15,000 insect specimens, with over half of his collection listed as brand new discoveries. Henry's work helped provide living proof of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Henry's most significant contribution was a phenomenon now called Batesian mimicry. After watching Heliconius butterflies, Henry realized that the birds avoid eating them because the birds had learned that the species was toxic and tasted terrible. Next, Henry realized that other butterflies looked remarkably similar to these toxic butterflies, and so they were tricking predators into believing that they too were toxic and would taste terrible. Ultimately, Henry correctly surmised that this survival technique would ensure the survival of the species. And Henry generously shared most of his observations and suspicions with Charles Darwin, who happily received the information and encouraged Henry to publish his own work. By the time Henry's notes and discoveries were shared in his book called The Naturalist on the River Amazon, Charles Darwin called it the best book of natural history travels ever published in England. As Henry wrapped up his time in the rainforest, he had survived both yellow fever and malaria, in addition to many other uncomfortable maladies. Toward the end, it's not surprising to learn that Henry had grown weary of the enormous challenges of life as an explorer. He wrote, I suffered most inconvenience from the difficulty of getting news from the civilized world downriver, from the irregularity of receipt of letters, parcels of books and periodicals, and towards the latter part of my residence, from ill health arising from bad and insufficient food. In the end, After a dozen years away from family, friends, and civilization, Henry Bates, the great naturalist, could not ignore what had been building in his heart. He was lonely. He wrote, I was obliged at last to come to the conclusion that the contemplation of nature alone is not sufficient to fill the human heart and mind. In 2014, Henry's Amazon notebooks were digitized, and they're now online to view from the Natural History Museum Library. And in 2018, Henry's remarkable story was shared in an IMAX film called Amazon Adventure. In unearthed words, today's words are from the American gardener, author, and nursery owner, Nancy Goodwin, from her book, Montrose, Life in a Garden. And this is an excerpt from her section called Late January and February. Nancy writes, I am a small person with short gray hair, usually dressed in winter in faded jeans, frayed at the knees and cuffs, boots, and layers of old shirts. And in summer, in faded shorts and shirts. A wide-brimmed straw hat without a crown 
protects my face from the sun. I generally pull a small aluminum cart loaded with a bucket filled with hand tools and a garden fork and spade as I walk briskly and look down to the right or left at plants and growth or for those expected to grow. My hands are usually dirty, my knuckles somewhat distorted, and when I reach my destination, I work on my hands and knees. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Concrete Garden Projects by Camilla Arvidson and Malin Nelson. This book came out in 2011, and the subtitle is Easy and Inexpensive Containers, Furniture, Water Features, and More. In this book, Camilla and Malin help us learn how to create with concrete a perfect medium for gardeners. Durable and weatherproof, concrete provides insulation for outdoor plants. Better yet, concrete weathers so beautifully, the edges soften, the color mellows, and it can be enhanced with lichen and moss. Concrete Garden Projects features excellent step-by-step instructions for many different containers, as well as elegant seating, miniature ponds and bird baths, stepping stones, and even a fire pit. Camilla and Malin love to use molds for their projects, and happily, most of their go-to molds are easily found or made from household items like kitchen bowls or pans or simple wooden frames or boxes. And in terms of cost, concrete is so affordable, just pennies per pound, and so simple to use. Just add water and then pour the concrete into the mold. Voila! This book is 132 pages of stylish vessels and projects made with budget-friendly concrete. You can get a copy of Concrete Garden Projects by Camilla Arvidson and Malin Nilsson and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3, which means it's an absolute steal to get. And it will give you tons of ideas if you're looking for projects to do around the house this summer. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, February 8th in 1807, that Jane Austen wrote to her sister, Cassandra. Jane loved gardens. She had a heart for ornamentals, herbs, and kitchen gardening, and her family always had a garden, growing their food and beautifying their home with flowers. And it's no surprise then that in every one of her books, Jane included gardens. We know from Jane's letters to her sister Cassandra that gardens brought her joy, and they were also very regulated for her. Now, in this letter that Jane wrote on this day in 1807, Jane wrote about her garden redesign, which included syringa or mock orange. And when she writes about syringa, Jane mentions the poet Cowper, who used the words syringa ivory pure in his poem. Jane also writes in this letter about laburnum. Laburnums are small European ornamental trees that have hanging clusters of yellow flowers. The beautiful hanging yellow flowers are how laburnum got the common names golden chain or golden rain. Now, in modern times, one of the most significant elements of Rosemary Veery's Barnsley House Garden is the yellow laburnum walk. In fact, many people consider Rosemary's laburnum walk to be one of the most iconic garden plantings of the last 50 years. 
Rosemary had seen Russell Page's Laburnum Arch, which was likely the inspiration for her Laburnum Walk. And if you ever get the chance to see it, Rosemary's Walk is a vision. The Laburnums romantically drape over a sea of allium that's parted by a concrete walkway that's texturized by pebbles. It's absolutely glorious. And it's no wonder that Jane Austen was considering planting a laburnum. So without further ado, here's Jane Austen's letter to her sister Cassandra, written over 200 years ago today. Our garden is putting in order by a man who bears a remarkably good character, has a very fine complexion, and asks questions. The shrubs which border the gravel walk, he says, are only sweet briar and roses, and the latter of an indifferent sort. We mean to get a few of a better kind. And at my own particular desire, he procures us some syringas. I could not do without a syringa for the sake of Cowper's line. We talk also of a laburnum. The border under the terrace wall is clearing away to receive currants and gooseberry bushes, and a spot is found very proper for raspberries. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely May Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.